I guess before I start sharing my slides in my talk, I want to underscore uh, one thing that uh, Governor Lane said about how uh, research at the European Central Bank has really blossomed uh, in recent years and recent decades. Uh, I did have the pleasure uh, and privilege of speaking at this conference. It was just two years ago, it seems like 20, but in 2019, and indeed, uh, I learned an enormous amount from the other conference participants, but especially uh, researchers at the ECB. Uh, I, I, some very interesting work, uh, for example, on the effects of negative interest rates, but many other topics. And I find myself uh, as a researcher, certainly when I'm uh, teaching new topics, constantly uh, finding uh, research from the ECB, which uh, speaks to it. And I'll come back to this issue of the technocratic importance of central banks later. But anyway, with that, uh, I will uh, uh, share my slides. Which I, I gather take a minute to come on, but I will uh, proceed as if you're seeing it already. Um, so I, I was originally given a title for this, uh, or we agreed on a title for this of uh, the interaction of monetary and fiscal policy. But I actually think that's a little narrow in terms of the debate around central banks today. So I'm trying to broaden it uh, along with all the discussions of how central banks might uh, broaden uh, their topics. Um, so I want to emphasize that when I speak about central banks, I'm thinking of all central banks and not just the ECB and the Federal Reserve. And uh, each faces its unique challenges, its unique environment in which it uh, operates. And I'm going to try to stress uh, some of those differences uh, here. Uh, before I proceed, I just want to mention that the figures I'm presenting here draw on a series of papers I've done with uh, mixes of co-authors, including Ahan Kos, Francisca Snorge, Carmen Reinhardt, uh, and Ethan uh, Ilzitsky. Uh, uh, they're uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned beneath the slides. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, first, let me start by giving a brief overview of what I hope to cover today and starting with the fact that the challenges facing emerging markets are way different than what are facing advanced economies, at least uh, for the moment. Uh, they are not facing ultra low interest rates. They are very limited in their fiscal space uh, compared to advanced economies. A number, uh, a small number, are already in default. Many, many developing economies are in default, and so it's something very different. But I'm going to try to talk about that also. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to turn to advanced economies, uh, but particularly talking about the uh, debate over expanding the role of the central bank uh, in, you know, at the zero bound. So let me just try to summarize a, a few points just in case it gets lost in my various figures and slides. First, there's no question that the role of central banking has morphed. Uh, it's far different than when I wrote my 1985 paper, theoretical paper, making the case for having an independent central bank. I wasn't beginning to think about any of the roles that it plays today. Um, and there are one of the factors that has is, is uh, coloring this debate is the central banks have been very successful in their achieving their mandates, uh, certainly in bringing down inflation. And it's created an appetite for having central banks do more since they seem to do things so well. A second thing which has affected central banks uh, for sure is the zero bound on interest rates. I'm going to talk about that later, which I think to some extent takes away the most powerful traditional instrument central banks have with no, uh, I'll, I'll be more specific about that later. Uh, I'm going to come uh, at the end to the expansion of targets, areas where I think uh, it's very clear 
areas where I want to suggest maybe a different focus. Um, Lars is giving a terrific talk tomorrow. I can make an advertisement for, I mean, I haven't heard the talk, but I've looked at the papers and he uh, makes uh, some of these points far more deeply and in, with more focus than uh, perhaps I'll succeed in doing uh, today. But let me uh, just cover a few things. First, I think one of the achievements of central banks that's really been quite remarkable is by being such technocratic institutions. I started my discussion with praising the research that's come out of the European Central Bank, but that is really the foundation on which central bank influence rests. That yes, they're not always right. The newspapers and op-ed writers are constantly saying central banks can't predict anything, they can't do anything right. Well, Maybe, but they do things a lot better than they were done before. And I think that's part of why other agencies, other people are trying to think of ways to emulate them. Uh, so that the technocratic expansion has certainly uh, been good. Um, on the and and I of course I think I'd be less than honest not to emphasize a lot of this has been about economists. And if you don't like economics, I do. But if you don't like economics, you're probably a little bit less enthusiastic about this uh, center of uh, research and uh, research almost empowerment that we see in central banks. But of course, as central banks expand into more political domains, that's inevitable. And I'm not saying, you know, it's something that can be completely avoided, but I think it obviously creates pressures. You, you know that. Something maybe you don't think about as often, but because I teach at a, a great university, which covers many, many fields, I see it more as uh, central banks have accumulated more power and expanded their remit. Uh, sociologists, political scientists, anthropologists, business economists uh, are writing papers about this and say, wait a second. If you are getting more into political economy, if you are getting more into political decision making, we think our discipline has something to say about this. And there's a growing rich variety of papers and research about this, not so much about the issues we looked at in the 80s and 90s, but really about these modern day issues. I just say at an, you know, to us, maybe an extreme, but not so much in the field. There are certainly very credible sociologists, political economists arguing that central banks have been an enabler of financial globalization and of financial markets, which has led to greater inequality, partly by helping firms move their businesses around. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get into a critique or discussion of that, but just to make you aware that particularly as the remit of central banks expands as they take on new new uh, tasks or as they aim to, uh, there's certainly uh, very powerful intellectual forces uh, that are wanting to weigh in on all of this. Um, I'll mention there are other areas, of course, but I'm gonna, certainly going to talk about uh, uh, the environment and green economics. Uh, that's the focus, I believe, of Lars's talk tomorrow. But I, I just the point I think I've been making uh, that he he makes I think much more deeply is that uh, you know the central bank's job should probably be more in steering the ship than deciding where the ship's going to go. Uh, central banks don't have the democratic accountability. They don't have necessarily the breadth of technical capacity, even if they're great at economics, uh, maybe to make some decisions and some very fraught political decisions uh, that need to be made. I just mentioned uh, one thing again, as a, you know, someone who teaches at university, I think the younger generation's extremely well-educated in uh, climate science and issues around climate, they're much less well educated on energy. 
and exactly what the trade-offs are going to be in order to go from one place to another. I think central banks have a big role to play in ensuring stability along this path. Uh, if, and I very much hope we do, uh, have a more aggressive transition to green, and I realize a lot of the people I'm speaking today to today are in Europe, which has really taken many admirable steps in this dimension. But as you well know, other parts of the world have different challenges, different problems, and uh, you know, not you know, fa facing facing different trade-offs. And it's not going to be so easy to think of how to make this transition. And what I'm getting to about central banks is there will be volatility. We've seen volatility around the pandemic uh, as first when there's the shutdown and now as the supply chains uh, have clogs in various places. Uh, you've seen it with wind uh, lacking in Europe this summer and creating energy and price volatility. And, and, and I think as we go on, we're not going to get it exactly right in making the energy transition. And by we, I mean governments and political entities. And central banks will absolutely be needed to step in in parallel or maybe new ways to that they've done over the last 15 years in trying to have more stability on, on that path. And I, I would just say that, you know, rather than say, well, the world could fall apart in 50 years, that will create a lot of instability. Instability is in our remit. So central bank, it's in our, our, our uh, it, it should be one of our uh, targets uh, and say, therefore, central banks should step in today to try to deal with this. I think that's actually not the best argument and not the right focus for central banks. Um, again, Lars says something in his JME paper that you know we can't pretend we know more about climate science than we do, but central banks can provide uh, their classic stabilizing role. And I think that's something that's very important. Uh, I'll briefly mention inequality I, I actually think uh, cryptocurrencies and digital currencies is an area where central banks really need to take the lead. Uh, they're doing that to some extent. Uh, again, there's great work going on at the ECB, many, many central banks. But I also think in terms of power within the government, who should be the central regulator, this is one area I would put more of the uh, more with the central bank. And I, I say that not simply because I believe in economics and the competency of central banks, but I say that also because I, I think we need a lot of international coordination in the sphere. And it, it's very difficult to do that when you're trying to coordinate disparate entities. And I think central banks, among their many accomplishments of recent years, have really demonstrated quite a capacity for uh, coordination. All right, I have to pause just to show one graph which sets the stage for some of the remarks I'm making later. I showed a version of this graph in 2019 in my talk. It is very, very familiar to you. Uh, uh, Philip Lane emphasized this point at the very outset of talking about what the new challenges are to monetary policy. This is the uh, a measure of the 10 year real interest rate with treasury bills. There's a lot of talk about the secular decline. Uh, I, I actually think I, uh, <clears throat> I actually think that describing it as a secular decline is not really an accurate description of what is going on. Uh, Paul Schmelzing, who was at Yale and I had the privilege of uh, having as a thesis student when uh, he, he uh, was in the history department, also working on finance, has papers, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, showing the trend decline of real and nominal interest rates over eight centuries. And one of Paul's findings is that there is a trend decline in real interest rates, but it's very slow. It's on the order of, say, 1% every 50 years and not three or three and a half percent 
over 12 years. And I believe, you know, a, a, a significant part of what we've experienced is a reaction to the pandemic and not these long run trends about which there are many papers about uh, inequality, uh, demographics, et cetera, but there's something else going on. And I think the main point I would make about this is we just don't know what's around the corner. This has been quite surprising. So you're very familiar, I think all of you with the debate that's going on in advanced economies, but let me just say what's happened since the pandemic, what's going on in emerging markets is and in developing economies is remarkable. There's been uh, the IMF and the World Bank, which have their annual meeting shortly, uh, will release reports highlighting this problem. Uh, it's not that I, I've seen them. I, I know that they will because it's important to them, but I've seen what they've written in the past and they've ma made this point. Uh, and, you know, we, we're going through an extremely difficult period for them. Whatever is going on within countries in terms of inequality growing, it's probably worse uh, across countries. We are, we're looking at, we had been looking at an era of globalization and growing global equality. If you count all citizens of the world the same. Yeah, I, I understand there are many nuances to this, the elephant diagram of global inequality, but by and large, um, you know, Thomas Piketty emphasizes the point that capitalism's led to inequality not if you count everyone in the world the same. It's lifted uh, billions of people out of abject poverty. And uh, the, this period we're going through has been a reversal. Uh, it looks like it's going to be very difficult for many years to come. I'll say a little more. So, of course, emerging markets have vastly less fiscal policy space. They're actually a uh, few in default. Uh, I think uh, Suriname, uh, Zambia, Argentina, Lebanon, and Ecuador. Uh, but uh, there are a lot there of emerging markets in a more precipitous place. I don't want to overstate this point. I would say some countries such as Brazil and Mexico to date have weathered the problems better than you might have thought. But nevertheless, if you look at the prognosis for their growth, uh, for their health problems, for their various issues they're facing. Uh, it's very different. And in particular, I'll show you one graph in a second. Just as you see the interest burden of debt falling in advanced countries, it is rising across much of the rest of the world. Uh, debt in advanced countries is rising, but the interest burden has been falling. I'll come to it in a second. But in emerging markets and uh, and and uh, even more so in developing economies, which are many cut off from credit, that is not the case. And a much higher share is owed to foreigners, which is which is also uh, a, a, a big source of fragility. Uh, one further point I would make is that in addition to just looking narrowly at fiscal, you need to think about more broadly how private debt has expanded. And there have been papers on this. My, my work with uh, Ahan Francisco and Carmen uh, released uh, recently talks about this. Uh, it's of all the different kinds of debt that have been rising. And in, in, in emerging markets, especially, there's not always a clear demarcation between what's private and what's public. State owned companies, uh, small countries that are entirely reliant on a couple of businesses. Um, but uh, in addition to that, they have banking issues. Now, in advanced economies, <clears throat> we had the global financial crisis, which, of course, wasn't really global. I think it's more accurately described the 2008-2009 crisis as the advanced economy financial crisis. The emerging markets came roaring out of the financial crisis. They had a dip. But thanks to the rising prices of commodities, uh, the remarkable growth that China sustained, they did not suffer the same way. But consequently, they didn't institute the same banking reforms. 
Uh, and so I think also there's some questions going forward, <clears throat> not simply about, you know, what we narrowly see in death, but what's going on with our banks. And of course, very much as Ireland, Iceland, Spain experience, uh, I think there are many concerns going forward around emerging markets. Uh, well, this uh, uh, graph, you know, uh, but I'll put it up anyway, which is giving interest payments and uh, interest uh, rates in advanced economies. And they've both been trending down. And I, I think a point, you know, uh, you think about this all the time, but many lay people don't think about was the falling interest rates uh, have benefited advanced countries, not simply because today's short rates are lower, but advanced countries are constantly rolling over maturing debt. If you borrowed something 20 years ago, you were paying a much higher 20 year interest rate than you're gonna be paying today. And that's also been driving interest rates down and will continue to for a little while. On the other hand, in emerging markets, despite also having that wind at their backs, their interest payments have been rising. And maybe this isn't the most dramatic graph uh, because as it's laid out here, the interest payments as a share of GDP is still not that high, although it's rising. But this is uh, weighted by GDP. So it gives China an enormous weight. Uh, if you did it not weighted by GDP, it would be much more dramatic. And, you know, of course, if we go to 10-year uh, bond yields, uh, they're, they're very low in the uh, richer countries, but in emerging markets, they're high, and I'm not even giving some of the weakest emerging markets here. And of course, uh, we've seen a number of emerging markets recently raising interest rates already, I think. Uh, Poland, Russia, Hungary, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia uh, are all central banks that have been raising their interest rates of late. Uh, so they're facing a very different problem. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'm not the only one who thinks there's concern, uh, at least the World Bank speaking out about this uh, forcefully. We'll see what the IMF says. And the, certainly the rating agencies have been downgrading emerging markets. And then lastly, <clears throat> on emerging markets, this is a graph from a paper uh, by Kramer, Willis, and Yang. It was given at the NBR macro annual in April. And it uh, shows the different uh, quartiles uh, of wealth across the world. The blue is the poorest quartile. And you can see there was this period up to 2000 where there really had been convergence. The poorest quartile was doing better. And even after 2000, uh, there was an extended period where the second and third quartile were doing better than the first quartile. That actually had already slowed down before the pandemic. And this paper doesn't run through 2020, but with the numbers such as the IMF and the World Bank are releasing, it's gotten much worse. So the world's central banks are facing very different problems. Let me... Uh, let me turn now to advanced economies, and uh, I'll have to refer back to my 2019 talk to the various books and papers I've written about this. I don't, I'm going to give some very strong views, but I think I uh, nuance them, explain them, and defend them in these various writings, but just for the sake of clarity, uh, you know, uh, make make these points. Um, uh, first, as it says in the top line, you know, the advanced emerging distinction is more of a continuum, uh, and you know, uh, Greece uh, is not the same as Germany in terms of you know its graduation from problems. Although it's been very uh, obviously, a lot has changed in the last ten years. But I do think the impact of the zero bound is profound. I remind you, my talk from 2019 was about how to think about in normal times, which unfortunately we're nowhere near at the moment, but in normal times, if we continue to have the kind of downward trend in real interest rates that Schmelzing documents, uh, and certainly the very well-known papers uh, by Williams, uh, Laubach, and Holston uh, 
that they document. If we continue to have this, uh, we need to think about how to do effective zero, uh, negative interest rate policy. And of course, there are challenges, but there are with everything, and I'll come back to it. But instead, central banks are forced to rely on other instruments. Now, the ECB is different because there is no corresponding treasury, and the role that the ECB plays is really correspondingly much larger. So in this remark I'm making, I'm really referring to uh, single country central banks. I, I don't know what your terminology is for it, uh, but like the United States, like the New Zealand, uh, like the United Kingdom now. Um, and uh, I, I, I argue in my book that uh, really quantitative easing is not an instrument. It's really just maturity transformation. It's not an instrument which is at all special to the monetary authorities. There's nothing they do that couldn't be done by fiscal authorities. Uh, okay, in a crisis, it's completely different because the, that's the classic role of central banks to be able to move very quickly and forcefully in a crisis backed up by the fiscal authorities later when needed. There's no questions about what was done in the pandemic, what was done during the financial crisis, where I have to say central banks were not only forceful, but quite creative in their responses. But in normal times, which will happen again someday, uh, for example, in the United States, one week treasury bills actually, last I checked, pay a lower interest rate than reserves. They're a very perfect substitute. It's really just maturity transformation. And, and yes, there's some liquidity effects. Uh, uh, my colleague, Javier Cabex, and uh, his co-author, uh, Ralph Cochin, uh, have papers emphasizing how these short-term liquidity effects in the banking sector are big, but they're not the same as interest rate effects. It's not nearly as powerful an instrument. And again, uh, you know, that at least you know, in the United States, the Treasury is constantly refinancing trillions of dollars every year. And its choice of maturity structure to choose overwhelms anything the Federal Reserve could do in, uh, in normal times. So, uh, and, and I would say the same about what I would call fiscal QE, where the private sector, uh, where, the, where the central bank, buy, so I'm referring to pure QE there, where the central banks buying uh, treasury bills or treasury bonds. But when it comes to uh, fiscal QE, which is my term for when uh, central banks buy private sector debt, uh, that's also certainly something the fiscal authorities can do. In fact, uh, through various guarantees and various different uh, facilities that government set up, the fiscal authorities are deeply entwined. But during a crisis, it's very different. But this isn't a unique role to central banks. Um, and I think this here, here, there's a very important overlap. But I think in both QE and uh, pure QE and fiscal QE, there's outside of crises, the central banks are junior partners in the relationship, not the ECB. That's different. Um, and then finally, um, as I as I mentioned, uh, you know, there's there's this push to have central banks expand what their list of targets are and being asked to weigh in areas that are thinly related to their mandate and expertise. They're it's part of the price of success, but it's also part of being stuck at the zero bound where these other activities aren't happening as much. Uh, you may get lucky. I say that somewhat sarcastically if that's allowed in this day and age. Uh, you may get lucky and inflation may rise quite a bit uh, and central banks will be very clearly focused on that for a while. But I don't think these other issues are, gonna, are, are necessarily going to go away. Um, so I, th I think I've certainly uh, covered uh, this, this problem uh, that the impact of the zero bounds really something profound. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, go off on it too much. And I'd particularly say that it's a moment in time. There's so much crazy going on in 
uh, crazy is made, maybe not the right word, but such extreme changes going on in policy. It's been necessary to have, uh, you know, record fiscal deficits outside of wartime. It's been necessary to do all sorts of things to try to uh, protect people, uh, deal with this tragic uh, pandemic. So I, I'm not referring to this, but it will change. And uh, I, I think how to think of bringing back uh, the use of central banking to make interest rates negative at the short term without the constraints that we face at the moment is uh, very important. And there are um, there's certainly uh, ways to deal with this I'll come back to. Um, I want to take a tangent, if you can forgive me, on another piece of my research, but it, it, it's really remarkable evidence to me that how dormant normal monetary policy has become. And uh, this comes from a paper uh, I gave at the end of last year at the Brookings panel with Ethan Olsitsky and Carmen Reinhardt, which observed that if you look at the center of the global financial system, exchange rate volatility has collapsed. And even during the pandemic, it's actually been trending down for, uh, certainly since 2014, arguably before that. And by the center, I mean the Euro, the yen, the dollar, you could include uh, the RMB, although of course the Central Bank of China somewhat fixes uh, by design. So this is a, a, a volatility graph from our paper. There are many different ways to look at it. This is the US dollar. This is from 75 uh, through 2020, obviously taking a, a synthetic Euro uh, before the formation of the Euro. And you can see this decline, even this remarkable decline during the pandemic. I could show you the same thing uh, for the yen, uh, even more remarkable. And yes, there's a lot of talk about exchange rate changes, but let's not forget dur during the financial crisis, depending on whether you look at intraday or end of day, I mean, the euro, you know, went between, I don't know where, you know, up to like 160, 159, 160, and had, you know, gone down below one, you know, at one point. I mean, that's just nothing. What we're seeing now is just nothing compared to that. And I think another interesting observation of this decline in volatility is that if you look at dollar euro volatility, and I could have picked uh, other four currency measures relative to other assets, uh, exchange rate volatility didn't just go down in absolute terms, it went down during the pandemic relative to oil, relative to commodity prices, relative to the S&P uh, 500. And uh, we don't know all the reasons for this. Um, of course, there are other candidates, and I, I, but the one I think that we think is the leading candidate is that not only is interest policy of the advanced countries at the zero bound, but you know it's going to be at the zero bound for a, a time to come. Yes, there's forward guidance central banks give, but I think it's been pretty clear to everyone that the shadow negative interest rate, the shadow interest rate, the interest rate that you might have gotten during the pandemic, and I, I don't necessarily speak at this minute, I'm not trying to comment on current policy, but the shadow interest rate during the pandemic uh, was negative. It wasn't just a little bit negative, it was very negative. So I think markets recognize that and it might have contributed to reduced exchange volatility. I have to say, there's another explanation, uh, which is the US expanded the use of swap lines, although that did not have nearly the same effect during the financial crisis. And uh, you know, finally, just to complete this thought, uh, if you look at G4 currency volatility, so I'm bringing in China, and you look here as a graph, a figure, which contains both the Breton, the sort of halcyon era of the Bretton Woods system, 50 through 70, and looks at the Bretton Woods period, which we term the recent uh, period, the extended Bre uh, Bretton Woods too, uh, Dooley, uh, Dooley, Fokert, Landau, and Garber coined the term uh, Bretton Woods II, 
uh, talking about how Asia had been stabilizing exchange rates against the dollar. Many of the, their ideas are really uh, 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 used in Ben Bernanke's famous global savings flood speech. We now speak of extended Bretton Woods too, where even at the core, there's been this exchange rate volatility. And by the way, the title of our paper hints will this exchange, the fall collapse and exchange rate volatility survive uh, after COVID. Um, okay, just, you know, not to be difficult, but just a brief mention of negative interest rates, uh, which the ECB talks very candidly about. But I, I do think if we continue in this trend of downward, um, uh, our star downward neutral, uh, real interest rates, and we want to take low inflation, I think by far the most elegant approach would be to do what needs to be done to have short-term negative interest rate. I've written certainly chapters of my book about this and papers about this. Uh, you know, certainly theoretically, the most elegant approach is simply to create an exchange rate between paper currency and bank reserves. But there are a lot of trends which really make all this a lot easier in the short term, phasing out large denomination notes and having CBDCs uh, can make this transition easier as well. Uh, okay, I, I won't say any more. Uh, and of course, I just want to emphasize, I've said it three or four times already, the ECB is different. There's no pure QE There's in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the ECB because there's no Europe-wide fiscal authority able to coordinate to just counter whatever the ECB is doing, and, and it gives it a more significant uh, governance role. Um, I said my talk was about all central banks. I think I, uh, one other, let's say, digression I want to make is to underscore that the, the euro and even more the dollar are really quite unique. And so, some economists will write a paper about the United States and draw conclusions for uh, the United Kingdom, much less Australia and New Zealand. And they're, they're, they're not all the same. And of course, if you look at foreign currency reserves, uh, the dollar and the euro account for a very large share, central bank foreign currency reserves. Uh, this is um, from my QJE paper with uh, Dilzitsky and Reinhardt, which where we try to ask what is the currency around which other countries have their currency orbit. The dollar is absolutely uh, dominant and the euro after that. And certainly in terms of world debt markets, um, this is a big topic in Europe. The, this is, it's hard to keep up. This is from the end of 2020. And this figure is already wildly outdated. This is from our uh, slightly updated from our Brookings paper, but uh, the U.S. had almost as much debt outstanding in private markets as all the other advanced economies uh, put together. Okay, let me lastly come to the issue of should central banks expand their targets. Um, I've mentioned green economics. Uh, uh, there are people who think central banks have caused inequality, and I, I would listen to them, by the way, but uh, I, I disagree with the point. So there's a very narrow point, which is central banks have been bringing down interest rates, low interest rates, raise asset prices, high asset prices, make rich people even richer. And so you're doing a bad job because you're creating inequality. And of course, um, that fails to ask questions like, what if central banks didn't bring down interest rates? What would have happened to jobs? What would have happened to consumption inequality? What would have happened to recessions, welfare? And I, I, I think in terms of the global trends and in interest rates, which I highlighted earlier, the central banks are, are really followers. Yes, you have a big effect on the market the day you do things. Yes. Uh, the risk that you put into the markets and take out of the markets has an effect, but the larger trends have to do with uh, with with other things. 
Um, that isn't to say that as the targets that central banks take expand, you need to listen not just to other uh, political actors, but again, um, you know, speaking from within a broad university, there are many other disciplines that think they have something to say when you start, if you want to be talking about inequality. But my fundamental point is that's something central banks should care about, but it's very hard to make it uh, their target. I do think what the Federal Reserve did with nuancing what it meant by unemployment and maybe basically putting a higher weight on unemployment relative to inflation to take account of unemployment's effect on inequality, that, may, that, that I certainly wholeheartedly support and agreed with, but uh, there are limits. And, and then, as I mentioned, there are these broader ideas out there saying that central banks are partnered with the financial sector and that all eventually conspires against working people. Um, you will, you will, these ideas are in the winds of academics uh, in many disciplines, and you'll be hearing more of this. Um, of course, it's it's very hard for central banks to set objectives in areas outside their expertise. I will say one leading central banker, uh, actually leading former central banker at this point, um, said to me not so long ago that uh, this person believed that central banks have more competency in the economics of the environment than the rest of their government. That might be, it's not a very healthy situation for sure. Uh, I, 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 I think it's good that central banks encourage competency in this area, but I think it's really hard to be making decisions about what should be nuclear power, uh, should we use natural gas as a transition fuel, uh, and not just say we should never have natural gas. These are, these are political decisions that, that need to be made. Um, and of, of course, uh, where central banks can play a big role is saying, look, we, we back what you're doing, but we, we, you know, we're going to stabilize the economy. We are going to warn you uh, not to discourage you. We're going to warn you that there may be more volatility to come, and we are going to try to be creative in trying to deal with this. You may get inflation, you may get deflation, you may get larger business cycles, but we're not the ones setting the objectives. And again, uh, you know, uh, coming to this point that central banks should be steering the ship but not deciding where it's going when it comes to some of these 30, 50, 100 year, uh, 100 year goals. I do appreciate that it is important that as part of the uh, pillars of the establishment, the commanding heights of the global economy, central banks do need to speak out about the environment. At some level, it's very important what China does. And if the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve speak out forcefully, that helps. I, do, I don't want to discourage that. I'd say the same thing about the World Bank, the IMF, other global leaders. But I would not confuse that with the technocratic uh, side of things. I've talked about inequality. Let me just take one last subject, uh, cryptocurrency, which I've I also write about quite a bit in my 2016 book, and also I write there about the future of central bank digital currencies. Um, I think there's a very strong case here for central banks to play a leading role. And, and I think they have in some respects, uh, if you certainly look at um, what happened to Facebook when it introduced Libra, now Diem, uh, which is still forthcoming, they really ran into central banks. That was the first line of defense when the Swiss regulators uh, really reined the uh, Facebook uh, cryptocurrency in was by saying, fine, but you make the central banks happy and then we'll go ahead. And that played an important role. In my own country, um, the uh, 
central bank regulators is it's in i'm sorry the uh, cryptocurrency regulation is just incredibly diffuse and that's extremely problematic uh there's a tendency as iswar prasad emphasizes in his recent book uh for people to like find the mo most permissive parent that they can find that will approve whatever they're doing there needs to be more centralization nationally, but also internationally. And I think this is a role for central banks. I, I, I think clearly uh, digital currencies, and there are many papers coming out about this. Uh, I was involved in a G30 paper, but it's one of many, many, and I, I mentioned wrote about this in my book. Um, th there's a lot to be said about this, but I do think it primarily uh, starts with central banks. Uh, back in uh, the late 1970s, the US Post Office uh, sued uh, companies producing fax machines. They claimed that that, it, uh, uh, that was a form of correspondence and therefore was included under their monopoly on correspondence. There was a uh, case, I think it even went to the Supreme Court, I'm not sure, but I think it did, about this, that the Postal Service lost. Uh, you know, it's sort of ironic, fax machines have lost too by now. But, uh, you know, one could argue, well, there are these new digital currencies, central banks uh, saying that they have a role, is a little bit like the Postal Service saying that it should be able to regulate fax machines and its monopoly extended to fax machines. That's, of course, nonsense. Uh, but, it, but I think for many reasons, we understand uh, central banks should play a central role. I, I mentioned here in an aside, there actually is kind of a digital currency already in the United States. Uh, it's called Treasury Direct. The Treasury doesn't advertise it on buses because I think they're worried it would become too popular. Uh, but I think that it, this should end up in the central bank. And, and then lastly, and perhaps most importantly about this issue and where central bank independence plays an essential role is it's very important to have political um, insulation from all the lobbying. I think a dynamic we saw with the financial crisis was the financial sector got very wealthy. There was a period when it was the biggest donor to both political parties in the United States. Uh, and it had a lot of it had a lot of influence. And there was uh, some good deregulation, but some bad deregulation. You're all very familiar with those problems. The point I want to make is we could see the same phenomenon here. Crypto is very exciting. It's producing a lot of money. There, of course, is some real uh, innovation here, but there's a lot of regulatory arbitrage, regulatory avoidance involved in crypto. And I think it's very, very valuable to have an institution which remains uh, independent and insulated. So let me just conclude by saying the case for central banking today is just far richer and more nuanced than I dreamed uh, when I was a junior economist at the Federal Reserve in the 1980s. And uh, I uh, got the idea of having a theoretical model of central bank independence. It's way too narrow. But on the other hand, the topic has become way more important. Thank you.